Good morning. Happy Sunday to all of you who are joining us online. My name is Pastor Randy. I'm the lead pastor of New Life Church. Most of you know that, your family and friends, but um, I'm sure there are a few guests coming online with us now, and I welcome you. Today it will be a different format than normal. At this time, uh, typically we would have the live broadcast of our in-person gathering service on the New Life Church campus. That has been closed down for uh, what will be a short period of time, I'm sure, maybe a week or two. Uh, the reason for that is that in the past week, a few of our people have tested positive for COVID-19, including myself on Tuesday past. I'm actually recording this introduction on Saturday and my health is just about back to 100%. So I'm thanking God for that and uh, all of you for praying for me and for a few others who have tested positive. To my knowledge, we're all in a uh, state of recovery. Uh, I went back over the, the past year of our services prayerfully and uh, chose a uh, service that was actually recorded on May 3rd, 2020. We were about eight weeks into the um, different presentation. Uh, we were at that time working with a team of about eight people only in the building to record our services. Uh, they were live broadcasts, but to put them together in a very isolated environment. It's interesting to see from then till now all that's transpired. Um, what grabs my attention the most is the goodness of the Lord. As we have striven for a year now to love one another, care for one another's safety, to honor authority, uh, not be um, panicked and foolish in our reactions, and also to abide by wisdom so that wisdom wouldn't abandon us, all three of those being scriptural principles. The Lord has blessed us. We've had miracles, salvations, healings, uh, financial provision. I could go on and on, but you've heard me talk about that many times over the past year. This is a year for the record book. If I ever write a book, I'll, cer I'll certainly include the COVID year as a chapter and speak about the goodness of the Lord. I don't have a bunch of announcements for you. Uh, just to let you know that we will be staying in touch through uh, social media tools that we're using, email and uh, Facebook and these kind of things. So stay tuned. I hope you enjoy the message today, which is about in encouraging you to have the peace of God. Don't be anxious for anything, but have his peace, uh, using, of course, scriptural principle. I've abbreviated the service, edited uh, the recording a bit so that the, the time is uh, shorter. It includes worship and praise. Uh, it includes the, the word of God. So uh, as you sit back with a cup of coffee and enjoy the word today, let Holy Spirit encourage you and strengthen you. Be at peace. Trust in the Lord. Uh, God is good in all of his ways, and uh, we'll be back together again very, very soon. Stay in touch with us. You can call the church number. Uh, the office will be open for contact through calls, emails, and whatnot, but please, uh, for a few days, not in person. In the meanwhile, trust in the Lord. Uh, if there's something we can do for you as a church, let us know. Stay in touch with us, and we'll do everything that we can. Um, and we'll be back together again very soon. Now enjoy the word. God bless you. Your praise will ever be on my mind. 
your name, Lord. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is our risen Savior. Lord, you were slain. Lord, you were the Lamb who was slain for us, but you are now the risen King of Kings, the, the Lion of Judah. Lord, our Redeemer, our Messiah. We worship you in spirit and truth. And we give glory to your name today. Lord, wherever people are connecting with us this morning, uh, Lord, over the, the stream, over the live stream in their homes, Lord, maybe they're at work, wherever they are, and they're connecting with us right now. I Thank pray there would be that strong sense yes. of the glory of the living God right there with yes. them, yes. encouraging them, strengthening them, blessing and protecting them. Let this be a day of miracles. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We proclaim your name, the name above every other name. We proclaim your blood, the greatest power that the, all of creation has ever known. And we worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, honor yourself today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn. Till I met you I was breathing But not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you Cause when you come
Holy 
Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captive, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power over darkness. Your name is power in the chaos. Your name is power. Maybe you've got a cup of coffee and you're relaxed and ready to hear the word. And we encourage you to do that. Um, Let's set our hearts aside for a time and season and just ask the Lord to bring revelation to us. Father, let my words be yours and your words be mine. Holy Spirit, govern my heart, and my mind, my thoughts. Lord, I just ask you to bring uh, our understanding to a place of revelation, rhema word, so that your written word delivered to us so faithfully becomes the living word of our hearts and minds right now. For your glory and your honor, I pray. Amen. Amen. Again, glad to have you here uh, with us. Looking forward to getting to know the new people who are online. And there are many of you. Uh, we've received uh, a lot of uh, communication. And recently, people who have never been here said that they're, as soon as the, re the restrictions are relaxed, they're going to come and join us here in the sanctuary. So that's going to be an exciting day to meet family that have been part of us for all this season, and uh, we have yet to, to know them personally, but we're looking forward to it. This is the 10th message in my series of messages that Holy Spirit has impressed upon me called Faith Shots. And uh, this, the slide on the screen is the series slide, but I've modified it a bit today. It begins by uh, looking uh, recognizing the key verse, but let's just go halfway through it. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now, I've deliberately, you can back up one, there you go. I've deliberately kind of made those words a little scary looking. I'm sure you're not terrified by looking at text on a screen. But uh, I want to point out that Paul isn't just talking about an attitude of fear. The Apostle Paul writing here is certainly referring to the atmosphere, the attitude that gets created that's full of fear. But he's also refer referring to a spirit that operates in the, in the realm or the area of fear, propagates fear. Uh, right now, the spirit of fear has been released on the planet like it hasn't been for many years. He's, he's, you know, the enemy is always at work in these ways trying to generate fear, but the COVID-19 situation has generated some things that the, in our lifetime we haven't seen. I might preach a message sometime soon uh, echoing Solomon's word that's nothing new on the earth, but it's new to us uh, to be in a situation like this. And this spirit is dynamically active in every circumstance of terror or anxiety or fear or hopelessness, and that's what it does. Uh, along with it is, and, and there's another sermon, the spirit of fear partners with the spirit of stupid, but um, I'll talk about that another time in detail. But it's dynamic what's happening in our nation and in nations around the world right now through this spirit. And if you don't believe in principalities and powers, it's unfortunate because the enemy gets to work uh, with free uh, operation in your life and around your life because you don't even recognize that it's there. The word tells us that there are principalities and powers. In fact, it says that we don't war against flesh and blood here. We are really in a battle, in, a, in a, a conflict against spirit, principalities and powers that are released on this earth for a time. That's not to say we don't have help, but it is to say that you need to understand the nature of the conflict. This enemy is using the events of this day, the circumstances, whether it's sickness or financial strife, the loss of a job or conflict in the family because of all these things. The enemy is using these things to cause terror, virtually terror, in the hearts of humanity. 
Fear generates a host of reactions, most of which cause loss and destruction. Uh, And that's the intention of our adversary. The Bible is very clear about that. If he can use humanity to operate out of panic, to create, generate, propagate panic, and if he can influence us to operate out of that, then his task is a lot easier. And what task is that? Well, John 10.10 says the thieves, the enemy, his purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. Uh, it says also in uh, Peter, 1 Peter, the 5 and 8, to, to, we're advised to stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a what? A roaring lion who's looking for someone to devour. These are very uh, descriptive words that we should understand, that we should not, not ignore because the enemy's ways are to steal, steal your joy, steal your peace. He wants to kill, kill your hopes, kill your dreams. And if he can, he would take your life. He wants to destroy. He wants to devour like a lion that's prowling. So I'm not trying to generate more fear, but I'm really trying to speak the word in a way that it awakens us to the activities and nature of the enemy because he's operating all around, and sometimes we don't recognize what's happening as the enemy's tactics and ways. I could spend a long time describing the events of this last week or two in our nation uh, as this. Um, I could go back years and, and, and talk to you how, how in, in our governing halls, the enemy has been very, very busy trying to destroy any sense of unity in our nation, trying to destroy character, trying to destroy uh, financial uh, blessing. He wants to destroy everything that he can. And he'll, do, he'll destroy anything that we give him the freedom to do that with, with to use fear with in such a way that it'll take away all of these blessings. He'll destroy through our choices. Don't let that pass you by. I'm not judging you. I'm simply stating facts and truth. The enemy, if he could, would destroy through the choices that we make or the choices made that affect us from other people's lives. He will destroy through our reactions that flow out of fear. You know, when you act out of fear, you don't act out of knowledge and understanding, and you don't act out of peace. So your actions are traumatic. They're, they're ungoverned. They, they, you could walk right into a dangerous situation or a situation that brings harm where you wouldn't otherwise if you were thinking out of a sober and a uh, controlled moment that had peace in it. So the enemy will use any tool that we allow him to in our lives, and the spirit of fear is particularly prone to causing these activities. Or you could act out of anger. Fear generates a lot of anger. People react different ways when fear comes their way. A lack of self-control. Some of the activities around our nation in the past week, the, the uh, uh, protests that have generated acts of violence and words that are, vi- are vitriol and, and, and nasty, that's a product of fear, by the way. That generates anger that then generates all kinds of other failures. So God's plan is never to have us as believers, sons and daughters of God, operate out of the influence of fear. Can I get an agreement with you that are listening here and and over the the stream? God has never intended that you and I would operate out of fear. The only kind of fear is a different thing that God wants us to embrace is a holiness, a reverence. And that's not the same kind of fear that's operating in this world today. Jeremiah 29.11 speaks the plan of God to us. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. What a wonderful passage. It's a good one for you to embrace. Take a shot of this and post it. This comes from Cross Cards online and we're allowed to use it. And share it. Put it on your your timeline. This is a great message for the world to hear and understand, to receive that God's plan for you is not for destruction. Can we say it together? His plan is not for destruction. Paul declares God's provision through the Holy Spirit when we see the rest of this verse in 2 Timothy 1.7, says, uh, we can read the whole thing, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. These are the provisions of God, and they don't flow out of fear. Jesus tells us his plans for us in John 10, verse 10. He says, I have come that they may have life and they might have life more abundantly. Amen? 
What a great thing that God provides for us this way. That we would have not just enough life, not just adequate life, but abundant life. You say, Pastor, I'm not experiencing that right, not right now. Right now I'm experiencing loss or I'm experiencing want. No judgment on you for that. None whatsoever. But I'm telling you, God's word is true and he is faithful. Therefore, these principles will be manifest in your life as we together help one another to come in line with what generates this. You know, the nutshell of my message is a question again, but it's answered right away. And the question is, is there a way to live beyond the anxiety of fear and, is it, and its devastating impacts? And God's word says, yes, there is. There absolutely is. And I want to talk to you about that today for a while. I'm going to take you to the passage uh, at the focus. Pastor Jeremy used this in his message along with many others a couple of weeks ago. An excellent word. Online, by the way, you can go back and view these uh, messages. Wednesday night, two weeks ago, right? Um, but the passage, I'm going, to, I'm going to really focus on this passage for the rest of my message. is Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading in verse 6 right now. It says, don't worry about anything. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. In fact, why don't you read it with me at home and here in the room? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace, what? Then the God of peace will be with you. What a great promise. I love the, how, how Paul finishes up that passage. Then the God of peace will be with you. Well, then attaches us to whatever came before. It's a condition. So we need to pay attention to those conditions. So the title of my message today is Anxious for Nothing and Peace in All Things. Uh, this is, as I said earlier, message 10 in my series on faith, shot, faith shots. So why don't you say the title with me? Anxious for Nothing peace in all things. And is it possible? The Word of God says, yes, it is. So let's talk about a little background on the passage. I don't always do this, but it's a really good thing for us to do as we go into a book uh, of, the, of the Word of God. Paul is writing the book of Philippians as a letter to the church, and he's writing it as a prisoner in Rome. Can you imagine? Some of the most amazing things, uh, uh, words of God that we still find life in today in the New Testament were generated while Paul was sitting in a Roman prison. How phenomenal is that? The worst of circumstances you could think of, and there he is generating by the work of Holy Spirit words of life that still touch our hearts today. He had been um, to Philippi um, at least twice in his missionary journeys, and he was used by the Lord along with others to establish the church there. It was the very first church, by the way, that was established in the European continent. So Philippi was a Roman colony, a military settlement, and there were soldiers present, and, and the Roman rule was present. It was a prime location for trade routes along the main road connecting Europe and Asia. So it was so uh, valued by the Romans that they actually would retire from their military service there, and they called it L Miniature Rome as a nickname because of its popularity. Uh, Philippi was also a place that was renowned for its pagan worship. There were shrines to the god of wine called Dionysus. It was uh, known also for the pagan worship of uh, Liber and Lib Libera and Hercules. That's a name you recognize, uh, the Greek um, demigods. Uh, the, the women of Philippi played a major role in the pagan worship of the goddess Diana, which was associated with fertility. And I won't go into the details of that kind of worship. Uh, it was broken. It was, it was uh, perverted. It was definitely not something that was Christ-like in any way, and the church should not have a part of it. 
just, just to say there were at least another 140 Egyptian deities that were worshipped in Philippi by practice. So uh, that's pretty um, significant that we note that the atmosphere in which this was happening, uh, the, this letter was being written and the ch first church in, in Europe was growing, it was an atmosphere that was difficult in, in so many ways. Roman rule, persecution, uh, pagan worship of multiple deities. I want to also point out this was the city where, uh, you, if you remember, Paul cast a demon out of a little girl that was following behind him and, and saying, you're the servant of God, you're the servant of God. And he lost his cool and turned around and just cast the demon out of her and totally messed up her whole ability to tell the future, which she, she would do that for her masters. And they got really, really ticked with Paul and threw him in prison. You remember this in the word of God? And this is where in prison a miracle happened and the chains fell off and they were released from that prison dungeon and the jailer thought, I might as well kill myself because prisoners have gotten away under my watch. And he said, no, 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 chill, relax. It's kind of, you got to read between the lines to get all that vernacular in there. But he said, don't do this, we're here. And the, the jailer was so impressed by the nature of God in Paul that he turned his life over to the Lord and his whole family. So just some background on the city where this is being, uh, this is unfolding, and Paul's letter is written to, the book of Philippians is written to these people. There are challenges that were being, being addressed in the letter. The atmosphere of the day was rife, as I said, with paganism and Roman control, and the church had to contend with rising persecution and issues of disunity that were happening amongst the family and complaining that were happening among the family. So when you look at the atmosphere of that day and the focus of the book of uh, Philippians, you can see parallels to our day, can't you? Uh, in strife and conflict, paganism, worldliness, all, all it seems everywhere we look today, there's, there's paganism in our nation, worldliness in our nation, and strife and contention, and even within the church, the body of Christ. I'm so glad that these letters are recorded faithfully for us to be addressed and the Holy Spirit, He is able to apply them to us now. And that's what I've asked for Him to do for you and for me today. Paul's mission through the book is the encouraging of the church, the body of Christ, to live with joy. That's a recurring theme. And I'm not going to stay on that, but I want to point out a key verse, Philippians 4, verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. When? Always. And again I say, rejoice. This is really the hinge pin of the whole, the whole book of Philippians. And Paul is saying, you can have joy no matter what's going on. Always, in all things, you can be a joyful person. Isn't that amazing? Uh, in, in his day out of a prison, he's writing this to the church in Philippi in the midst of all of their challenges. Uh, I like another verse that I just want to mention in passing here, Philippians 3 and 8, where Paul says, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. His relationship with Jesus defined him, not the events of his life, the circumstances or the troubles. He, uh, who, who said that? I think Naomi said you can't let your, your inward condition be uh, determined by your outward. Is that you, Pastor Jeremy? Okay. A really great quote. You can't let your inward attitude be governed by your outward circumstances. And we have the ability to not let that happen because of what God has given us as his peace and his presence. And these words that Paul is speaking are not rhetoric for him. These are actually the manifested characteristics of his life. Although he was beaten, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked, in prison, all of these things had happened to him, and yet he had found the ability to rejoice in all things, always, and no matter what, the main thing is Jesus Christ. He says, for his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. Let's go to the, to the main text now. I'm going to start at verse 4 for this. Always be full of joy in the Lord, New Living Translation says. I say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. He can, I can almost see Paul as he's dictating this, and, and he's just really getting motivated in his prison cell. Anybody who tells, tells me I shouldn't get excited when I preach really doesn't understand that we're, we're, when you get to speak these living words, it just does something inside of your soul. So he says, rejoice, and let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. That's verse 5. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Wow. 
That is a powerful governing statement right there. In, in verses 1 to 5, Paul is busy telling the Philippian church to live with a certain Christian character and, and a set of virtues towards one another. And he tells them to rejoice no matter what they're going through. To, now, I'm not talking about happy. Happy is something that you can have come and go like the wind. But we're talking about a gift that comes from the Holy Spirit, a fruit of the Spirit, joy. And it's not conditioned by these things that are swirling around us. So he says, rejoice no matter what, no matter what you're going through, because joy is an enduring gift of Holy Spirit and not at all the same as happiness. I like being happy. Nothing wrong with being happy as long as it's based on good things. But joy is a condition that remains. He's challenging the family of believers to live in that joy and express Christian character toward each other, to show selfless unity and love to each other, and to stand against the enemy of their souls as they do this. Can you do both? Can you, can you do war and love at the same time? Absolutely. Sometimes going to war and going to battle is an expression of love. You, 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 you're defending people and things that are precious. How we do it is very important. He tells the people, you can have joy even in the midst of extreme hardship, but you've got to keep your eyes on the main thing. The Lord is coming back soon. Did you hear him? Did you see it in the text? You read it in a couple of versions, and you'll see that Paul is not just talking about, you know, we have the Lord present. He's talking about the Lord is coming back soon. We have the expectation of our Lord returning. So live with joy, live with character that reflects who we are because he's coming. And we have a mission. We have to, we have to help others, as many people as possible understand what really matters. It's not the money. It's not, it's not the power. It's not the things. It's... it's, it's so much more than that because the Lord is coming back soon for us. Good advice for us today. We need to maintain a spirit of joy in the Lord. Are you listening to me in your homes? Ask Holy Spirit to refresh the gift of joy in you today. He's not saying that we're immune to trouble. Not at all. He's saying that we can have joy even amid the trouble. And that's the key. No matter what circumstance we're in, I guess, I think it was Pastor Jeremy talking again. He refreshed us in that passage. You know, even in every circumstance, in, in blessing with much and in times with, with next to nothing, in the desert, I've learned to have joy. His advice to them is to be gentle with one another, one version says. Gentle in this passage means to be kind, uh, forbearing. In other words, being patient and kind with each other, not demanding personal rights. Okay, now I've just gone and said it right out loud. Not demanding personal rights. I am weary of hearing believers say we have our rights, having an emphatic declaration of my rights as we proclaim this out in the atmosphere. Do you realize that when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you laid down your personal rights? The awesome thing about that is God gives you your life back and says, live it for me, and I'll bless you with more than you thought you could have before. But when we start demanding our rights, we're, we're kind of missing the mark. Because here we are, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, we are to be people who are gentle, kind, unselfish, forbearing with one another. That doesn't have much to do with demanding my rights. Showing consideration to others. As I review these passages and think about the discontentment of our nation over the last couple of weeks now, and it's rising right now, so Christians, family of new life, beloved ones, let this be a time when, when the Spirit of the living God is speaking to you because the world around us is, is turning again from fear alone to fear that generates anger. And it's manifesting in the protests which have become violent and will become more violent in the next week or two, I believe. Don't be afraid of that. Ask the Lord to give you protection and blessing and wisdom. So it will do us well to keep our eyes on the Lord. He's coming back soon. Keep our eyes on our mission. He's coming back soon because time is short and the work is great. 
Jesus is going to return. What will you be doing in that time when Jesus returns? What would you have been doing leading up to that time? If the enemy can, he would consume and distract us with all kind of things and all matter of things. Now, you may be feeling like I'm judging. Uh, I'm picking on you if you've sent me information recently. You get in line because a lot of people send me information. So don't, don't be feeling that way. I'm really speaking out of what is in my soul and I believe Holy Spirit has generated. People are getting consumed, not just the world, but even Christians are being consumed with conspiracies and plots and theories about what's happening. Listen, I'm going to say it straight out. There's all kinds of conspiracies. There's all kinds of plots and all kinds of manipulation happening right now. Do you think that's something new? That there's nothing new about any of that. That's been happening since the beginning. The, 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 there's been all kinds of schemes of man and manipulations of man and evil actions of mankind since the garden. Don't be surprised that there's some kind of power person taking advantage of the COVID-19 situation. In fact, you should be wiser than the world to say, I knew that. You may not know all the details, but you know that that's going to happen. I'm asking you as my family to not let it consume you. Don't let the theories and the realities that are out there consume you because God has given us different mission. If the enemy can distract us from the mission of God, which is what? The kingdom of God reaching out with the gospel that people might know him and be saved. If the enemy can distract you with fear and plots and manipulations and conspiracies, if you spend time, copious amounts of time researching and delving behind that so you can know what's going on, let me say something to you as, as clearly as I can with as much love as I can. Stop it. It's not going to generate any life for you. Why do I say that? What right do I have to say that? Well, I'm not talking about my rights. I'm talking about biblical, scriptural, historical patterns that have honor in them. Can you talk to me and show me in the Word of God where the apostles and the early church uh, operating in a healthy moment were busy focused on the conspiracies and the plots of the Romans or the conspiracies and thoughts of the, the uh the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or of Herod. They didn't spend their time consumed with that. They recognized it. They were intelligent. They saw what was there. I'm not, I'm not advocating uh, ignorance. I'm saying that they didn't get consumed with that as the early church. They were consumed with one thing alone, and that is the heart of God to be busy with the mission that Jesus gave them. Go into this world. Preach this gospel to every creature. Wait for my spirit, but when my spirit comes, you will give you power to be my witnesses all over the world. Let this be what consumes you. If the enemy can, he will so encompass you with these tormenting things that he will rob you of the ability to be a witness, to be light, to be salt, to be effective in this world. And I'm not saying that you should be silent about injustice because some of you are getting a little hot under the collar right now. I can sense it. I'm not just making that up. I prayed about this in the wee hours of the morning. Holy Spirit said some people would be getting a little bit ruffled by this. I love you. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm trying to be a faithful shepherd and say, if you allow these things to consume your waking hours, you're not going to have many good sleeping hours. And you won't have very effective hours in the day to be a witness to your neighbor or your family. You'll be so busy with the conspiracies and the manipulations and the realities that are out there that that's all you'll be able to focus on. There won't be joy and there won't be freedom. There will be anxiety. There will be fear. There will be anger. Maybe protests that are followed by violence. And Paul is telling us that's not our way. I'm not saying be silent. I'm saying there's going to come a time when you should speak. But when you do speak, it should reflect the nature of Christ. Did you get that? When you do write, it should reflect the nature of Christ. When you post something on the social media, it should reflect the nature of Christ. Don't let the enemy suck your energy and your focus away from the main thing, which is Jesus in us and through us. 
do express yourself. You should contact your local authority, your, your governor, uh, representative. Write a letter that, that Christ would be proud of that carries his nature, saying that I believe in this and I'm praying for you, uh, Governor DeSantis. I'm praying for you that, that you would make wise decisions. And, and, and instead of judging and getting all vitriol and angry and saying, how dare you shut me up in the home? How dare you stop this and how dare you stop that? I understand those things. And listen, it will turn. Time is coming and it will change. But express your, the character of Christ whenever you do. And my goodness, get ready to express it in, when you vote in November. Let the church rise up with righteousness in her, valuing those policies that, that have life in them, that bless Israel, that have the, the principles of God's word in them. Those are the things. We're not so much focused on individuals as we are on the policies that we pray and, and, and hope that they will fulfill and the promises that reflect the heart of God. Don't ever be content to be distracted from the mission of the kingdom of God. It's precisely in days like these when the world around us is acting out of anxiety and fear and running all to and fro that we need to be the people who are not so that they can look and find some place of life and real health and real balance that comes from God. The love of God in us and through us must rule the day. John 13, verse 35, I don't have it on the screen, but you should mark it. John 13, 35 says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Did you hear that? I, I should have put this one on the screen, but remember it, John 13, 35. It is our love that will help all men know that we are his disciples. Not our vitreous words, not our angry protests, but the love of Christ will let people know that we're his disciples. All right, I still have a good portion of my message yet, and I'm going to finish today. Get another cup of coffee. Relax. Verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. This is one of the earliest passages that affected me as a young man and a young preacher. And, uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time in this passage. And I was going to go there and give you the wealth of my knowledge and wisdom accumulated over all the years. And Holy Spirit said, I'll knock that off. Just say what I need to say today. So that's where I'm going. He says, don't worry, but pray instead. And I know that the reaction in, on the surface to that is, oh, yeah, right, I've tried that. It doesn't work. Well, I would say to you, you didn't pray effectively then. I'm not judging you. I'm simply stating Scripture because if the apostle under the inspiration of Holy Spirit says, don't worry, but pray instead, that is where the answer is going to be found. Prayer always is going to be the answer. We are to pray about everything. And the word is used here in the original language is pray about even the tiniest little details. Tell God what you need and thank him. Don't miss that fact. You know, the church has lost its DNA, its spiritual DNA of going to the Lord with soul-soaking prayer. Times alone with God where you just get it out of your system. Tell him everything that's on your heart and on your mind. And you pour it out to the point of maybe even tears. And then you finally come to a point of silence when God says, Good, I, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to get that all out. Now let me pour something back in. That happens in prayer. And it doesn't have to be fashioned after King James Version or any kind of form or formality. You don't have to be in this room to do it, in your closet, in the desperate situation where nobody's watching but God. That's where you can really just pour out your heart to Him and let Holy Spirit begin to pour back into you. But if the church loses that DNA, let me tell you what's going to happen. If the church in America loses the DNA of soul-searching intercession and prayer, we are going to be ill-equipped for storms that arrive in our, in our land, like the one that we're facing right now. And there's a large portion of the church in America today that is ill-equipped to respond to and deal with the storm of COVID-19 and everything that surrounds it because you, you don't know what it is to get into that closet and just get with God. Turn off the TV, turn off the phone, turn off everything and just get with God for a while. And did you, did you know that the average preacher in America today spends three minutes a day in prayer? Real facts. I, I, I want to let you know that's not what your 
preacher does. I'm not being prideful. I'm just saying I couldn't function on three minutes a day in prayer. I would have nothing to offer you out of three minutes a day in prayer. And if that's what the average preacher is doing, then what is the average believer doing? The church has lost this and must regain a passion for the presence of God. That just uh, Not just what you find in corporate gathering. And I believe a lot... Boy, this is a whole other message. I believe a lot of what's happening in the wonderful ways out there, in spite of the COVID situation and being shut away in our homes, is that some believers have gotten back to that place where they've sought the heart of God and they found victory and the peace and the power that flows through that. It's a time for us to get ready. The storm is not done yet. But the church will not be done in if we rise up as a people of prayer in the presence of God. Can I get a witness in agreement? We need to get back to that atmosphere where we know God's presence. True prayer will always produce humility and repentance. That's a whole other message in itself. But just for a moment, let me say this to you. We have no business to get out in public and rage over personal rights until we've gotten on our knees and we've got into a place of humility and repentance. Did you hear that? We have no business proclaiming our rights as believers until we've gotten on our knees and found a place of humility and repentance with God. Repentance for attitudes, words spoken, uh, criticisms, whatever it may be. Again, I'm not judging you. I, I have to look at my own heart and I realize, oh God, help me to put a guard on my mouth and on my mind. Help me to put a guard on these things so that when, when something comes out of my life, it looks like you, it sounds like you, it feels like you, that people know where to go for life because they've looked at my life. I've got a lot of work left to do in my own heart. But I challenge you, New Life family, let's make this time a time of preparation because when the, when the restrictions are released off of this, there's going to be a massive work for us to do as the body of believers in a country that's traumatized. It's a dangerous thing. A dangerous position to demand your personal rights if you don't know what it is to be right with God. I'll tell you one thing you shouldn't say is, Lord, give me what I deserve. That's a dangerous prayer if you haven't gotten a place of humility, a place of tenderness with the Lord. Then he says, be thankful. Be thankful for what God has done. Be thankful for what he will do. Gratitude and thanksgiving remind us that God is always on task. If you look back, uh, we sing a song, we haven't done it for a long time. When I think about the Lord and what he's done, it makes me want to shout. Sit down with a pencil and a piece of paper and start writing about the things God has done in your past. Make a list, fill up the paper, and before you open your mouth about what you need, look at what God has already done, and it will shape anything that comes out of your mouth after that. Gratitude is a great position to have if you're going to go to the Lord to petition Him for something in your life. He did it before. He'll do it again. We should have a song about that. Oh, we do. We did it today. He'll do it again. You think COVID is an insurmountable uh, uh, fortress? My goodness. Our God is bigger than any fortress. He's bigger than any disease. And we can trust Him. He's done it before. He'll do it again. When the storm is at its worst, this is when we need to surely know that Jesus is with us in this boat. He will stop the waves. He will calm the sea. But we need to trust him even when the storm is raging. Can I get an agreement? Thanksgiving is a powerful spiritual tool. I am grateful for God's preparation for us. I'm going to show Thanksgiving right now. You with me? I am grateful that God prepared us years before this day to, to step out when finances were not uh, abundant, to step out and invest in, in the cameras, in the technology, to step in the sound systems, uh, in people's lives, to invest so that we would be in a position for this day. God enabled us, and I'm thankful for the prodding and the pushing and the provision that he gave us because in this day, Though we're shut up in our homes, we are not shut up as people. The church is not locked away. The gospel is not locked away. And we have this great opportunity to let it go further than it did before. Our, some of our services are having four times as many people, I mean 400%, as many people watching them right now as there were before this time happened. Did you realize that? 
Sunday's message is now over a thousand people. I know by some church standards that's like, eh, by our, but but listen, I'm not judging us by other church standards. A thousand devices, so we don't know how many people. But I'm not going to judge us by other people's standards. I'm going to say, Lord, help us to understand what you're doing now based on where we were and where we are now and where we're going. And by that standard, God is bringing great increase to us. Praise the Lord. So thankful that provision was there financially for this day. We're helping people. We're, we're not shorthanded. We're not grasping to pay bills. God has provided, and we are able to continue with every blessing that we had before and more. I'm thankful for that. So I'm not going to start looking at the future and say, oh, but you know, it could change. It could be really bad tomorrow, and you never know what's going to happen. If we start talking and thinking like that, we are dishonoring the blessings of God in the past, and we are, are, are ignoring the, the, the faithfulness of God for the future. If you fixate on what you can't do right now, you will not be effective in what you can do. Fear will paralyze you, and you'll even do foolish things. But if you focus on what God has enabled you to do, His peace will enable you to do amazing things. Go to your neighbor. Go and see what their needs are. Knock on that door of that person who's alone and, and nobody else with them. Or, or talk to a neighbor perhaps next door who's distressed or angry or really upset and let, you know, let them pick some of your spiritual fruit off of your tree. <laughs> Keep your social distance. Make it safe. But be, be the presence of peace in a world of torment and turbulence for them. Verse 7 says, then you will, not you might, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. One of my favorite promises in the, all of the Word of God. I have lived my life reminding myself. To say that I've reminded myself of this verse a thousand times would not be an exaggeration. So much better to have God's peace than it is to have sharp human reasoning. Did you hear that? Than to have a witty, sharp, intelligent, educated mind. And I'm not against any of those things. But so much better than all of those things is the peace of God which exceeds those things. The promise is that we will have that peace if we're a people who petition the Lord over everything with thanksgiving, making our requests known to Him. That peace that goes beyond human understanding is yours. It's a divine gift. But it won't flow out of three token minutes of prayer a day. God's peace, that kind of peace, flows out of relationship with Him. But when you take that time to be with Him and know His presence and Holy Spirit's wisdom starting to come to you, peace will begin to do something very special. It says right there in the Scripture, it will begin to guard your heart, which is your mind. Guard you against fear and guide you in the future. That's, to me, that's precious. What flows out of a peaceful heart will always be infinitely better than what flows out of a panicked mind. Do you hear me? What flows out of a God-given peaceful heart will be so infinitely better than what flows out of a panicked mind. What we do now and how we do it must flow out of that sense of God's leading and Holy Spirit. So the virus is still present. It's not over. That's not being said to you to panic you, but it's reason for us to have wisdom, healthy perspective, God-given peace from God and how we proceed from this day. I want you back home in the church. I want you here. I want this room filled up again, shoulder to shoulder. That day will come. Don't you believe them when they tell you, well, we'll never be able to be together again. That's fear speaking. Oh, we're going to be a communist state. That's fear speaking. Oh, we're going to be ruled by socialism. That's fear speaking. Listen, we will be back again. This church will be filled wall to wall, front to back celebrating the presence of the Lord, will be dancing in the Spirit, rejoicing in the glory. Miracles will continue to happen. People will be saved. That is going to happen. That is not, that is not going to cease in this day. There may be a day coming when we'll be severely challenged with that. It's not this day. We will be back here. Can I get an agreement with you? We need a healthy perspective that comes from a soul saturated with the presence and the peace of God. Can you agree with that statement? 
a healthy perspective. Here's a perspective for you. Just taking a little something from Wikipedia, but applying it from godly perspective. The Spanish flu infected around 500 million people, one third of the world's population when it happened back in the early 1900s. It was considered to be one of the deadliest pandemics in history. A 2005 estimate put the death toll at 50 million and maybe as high as 100 million people. But the population of the earth was a lot less at that time. So that was about 3 to 5% of all the population died or was affected and died. 50 million died from that Spanish flu. It killed more people in 24 weeks than HIV and AIDS killed in 24 years. Not even one death is acceptable. You don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. My heart aches for every single family that suffered through this COVID-19 and lost a loved one. Not one death should be treated lightly, but let's have perspective to this day. In that day, there were 500 million. In this day, there's 3 million, almost 500,000 people that were affected. It's still less than that. Globally, the deaths back then were 50 million plus. Now they're 243, 244 thousand. All of those are heartaches. All of those are sad. But we need to have a perspective. We need to be thankful in this day we have uh, wisdom, we have technology, we have provision, we have uh, a government that has asked us to, to, to try and make wise choices. All of those things are important. But I don't put my trust only in that. My trust is in the Lord. My perspective is I'm thankful for the controls and the difficulties we've had to go through so that this, this could be curved. And I'm not going to get out there and I'm not going to criticize the authorities that have done that. I'm going to get out and pray for them. I'm going to appreciate my health and my safety. Pray for those who are struggling. Set your sight on God and what he wants to do and is doing right now in our nation and around the world in spite of COVID-19. Ask God to give you a healthy perspective to influence your personal life and your church life in such a way that when we come out of these restrictions, we'll be like a thoroughbred racehorse finally waiting for that gate to open. And it opens. And what has been done behind that gate will be eclipsed by everything that follows in the flood of God's gospel and evangelism and miracles outside of that. Could you agree with me on that? Yeah. When, when the doors open again, and they will, we're going to be wise. You were, maybe you were looking for me to give you a date. I can't give you a date. I think personally it could happen inside of a month, but I'm not going to promise that. Because we're going to be governed by love. Remember that verse I told you to pay attention to earlier? John 13, 35. Your love for each other will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Love says that we protect one another. We're not going to rush in here and fill it wall to wall before this thing is in a place of uh, better safety. And I'm not saying that out of fear. I have no fear right now, honestly. But I love those who are uh, of an older age and more vulnerable. And, I'm, and when we come back together, we're going to govern that. Maybe the first service will be an invitation for those people to come before the rest of the family. And we'll let out early enough so that they can go out through the side door and uh, not be exposed to others who don't even know they have COVID. We'll, we'll, we'll clean as best we can. And, and uh, then the next group of people will come in. And, and we'll, we'll resume in, in phases our healthy worship life. And it will get back to that place where we're all together again eventually. Maybe when we come back at first, there won't be children's ministries. Because how can you ask a six-year-old to abide by social distancing? Love says we cover. We look after one another. And we'll be, we, listen, this is six, seven, eight weeks that we've gone through restrictions and difficulty. We don't know what it is yet to go through the kind of persecution the church has had in the past and the shutting away that it's had in the past. We're not there yet, and we will come back to full expression. But by our love, the world will know that we're his disciples. So we're going to govern with love as we open the doors up in the near future. Did you hear that? Near future. We're not going to compare ourselves with other churches. Would you come in agreement with me? We're not going to criticize other churches. If they're meeting already, then I pray protection for them, wisdom for them, and I'm not, it's not my business to criticize them and judge them. We're going to look after our legacy people. We're going to look after our children. We're going to do everything we can to express that people matter more than schedules, forms, and the way we've always done things. 
Let's be wise and let our hearts be governed by love for each other. Prayerfully and thankfully, we'll step forward. And it's coming soon. Just endure a little longer. Be patient. We've gone this far already and great results have happened. Very soon we'll be back here again. So that passage goes to verse 8 and 9 as we finish today. It says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we can't leave this out. If you're going to read the verses before that, you need to continue on. It says, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Did you hear that? Set your mind. Fix your thoughts on what is true, not what is maybe true or conspiracy or Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable. Fix your thought, thoughts on what is right and pure. Fix your thoughts on what is lovely and admirable. Those words, you're, you're intelligent people. I, I, I would love to break those all down, and there's nothing wrong with breaking them all down, but I think you get it. Paul is telling us, listen, to live with this peace beyond all understanding, to live with the favor of God and have your heart guarded and guided, be thankful, be prayerful, and then fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you learned and received from me. He says, everything you heard from me and you saw me doing. That's a key point. I could spend another hour talking about that, but I want to just say, Paul is saying, don't just think about it. Don't just talk about it. Do it. Because in the doing, there is the example that you need to see and that the world needs to see. Be that kind of people in how you actually live it out. And there, here comes. Are you ready for it? Then the God of peace will be with you. Praise the Lord. Out of the abundance of the heart, your mind and your mouth speaks. There's a fountain there. There's a flowing. So if you allow your heart to be governed by God's peace and you ponder, you fix your thoughts on these things that are mentioned, there's going to be a shaping of your personal heart even though the storm is around you and the troubles around you. And that's going to be wonderful. Listen to the words of Christ in Luke 6, 45. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. An evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. When I say I could preach for another hour, I'm not exaggerating. I just, so much there. But it's, you can take that to your devotional time and think about that. I, I am. Proverbs 4.30, uh, 23 from the New Living Translation says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Did you hear that? Guard your heart because it's going to set the course of your life. From the, the New American Standard Bible, it reads like this. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. And if you do, then God of peace will be with you. Oh, praise the Lord. If you do, here's the recipe. Is it possible? To live beyond anxiety and fear? Yes, it is. There is a way to live beyond anxiety and fear and, and its devastating impacts. And God's Word says it's true, and we just went through it in Philippians 4. So as the worship team comes back and we come to a point of conclusion, I want to remind you of a psalm that we've already looked at and I've preached on. I'm just going to read it to you. Psalm 27, 1 to 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I remain confident. I remain confident. I will be confident, not in myself, but in Him. Amen? Amen? Well, I talked for a long time. You're probably on your third or fourth cup of coffee now. But you've been listening to me over the live stream, and some of you have had 
points of celebration with me. You're able to agree. Some of you may have even been challenged, and God forbid I wouldn't want to offend by my personality, but if the Word of God sort of pricked something and caused a distress, then don't react against it. Say, Lord, I receive your, your counsel. I receive your push, your transformation. I receive your Word. And let Him speak to you. God wants to do a work in you today. He wants to bring you past the fear and past the strife and past the agony, past the anger, past the distress. He wants to bring you into a place of his peace. And out of that will flow life. Out of that will flow celebration. Out of that will flow the power and, and the, the, the sending of the word of God through your, even through your social media so that people will have faith and come to Christ. If you're listening today and you don't have a relationship with the Lord, I want to tell you something. God put us together, not by chance. He put us together on purpose so you could hear that, that God loves you and he cares about you. He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you rest from this anxiety and the fear of this atmosphere. And when you find out that the God of all creation... <laughs> The God who keeps this earth spinning on its axis so that we don't perish is the God who loves you personally and knows you individually. When you realize that, you're going to find out that you can have his life in you. And it's a moment of faith that we're inviting you to take, a step of faith to invite him to forgive your past. That's what Jesus accomplished when he died on that cross and his blood spilled down to the earth. He died in your place. He was the sacrifice, the only sacrifice with pure blood that could erase the sins and the guilt of mankind. Not only did he die for you, but he rose again from the dead for you so that you could have life today, to have life now. And I'm going to invite you to accept him as your Lord and Savior before we sing this song. We're going back to sing Waymaker, a little bit different version this time. And... I would like to invite you to pray with me. Ask the Lord to begin a brand new life in you. And if you say these words with honest heart, with faith, the promise is to those who call upon me, I give them the right to become the child of God. So let's pray together. Father God, Father God I come to you with a sincere heart. I confess I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. Thank you for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. And you died on that cross for me. You shed your blood for me. I'm asking you to forgive my sins and be the Lord of my life. I believe that you rose again from the dead. And you give life to me now. So be my Savior and be the Lord of my life. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you made that decision, we sure want to know about it. Let us know. Send us a text, a message. And tell some believer in your circle of relationships that you know is a genuine believer that you made that choice. And begin to grow together, encouraging one another. Family of New Life, if you've struggled with fear or perhaps you've had some wrong reactions to fear, God loves you. <laughs> he loves you so much. He's so patient and gracious with us, me included. And he just wants to put that in a right place so you don't have that struggle anymore today. So as we confess that he's the way maker, he's the one who makes all things right, why don't you just make peace with him, make an altar right there with him, and ask him to govern the days ahead so that you'll be included in that wonderful flood of evangelism and miracles and revival and awakening harvest. Amen? As we sing this together, let's make this our altar. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. Yes, you are. I worship you. I worship 
Beyond a simple token prayer, hundreds and hundreds of people in connection with us right now are meeting you right in their living room with genuine, heartfelt, soul-saturated prayer, declaring how much we need you, declaring, Lord, there's places we need you to fix things and rearrange things and, Lord, resurrect things and make all things new in your presence but you are the god of all power and we trust you and ask you to do it right now yes. lord let fear just dissipate let it let, like like a, a cork was pulled on the room and all that fear is just leaving right now let peace flood in and peace that remains begin to govern each heart lord we come against sickness in the name of jesus and by the blood of the lamb uh, sickness be dealt with by Jesus' name. Yes. Sickness be dealt with by the power of the blood of Christ. Yes, Financial distress be dealt with in the atmosphere of the glory of God. Yes. Provision, we ask you, God, to open up wells, pathways, provision of finances, a, a new job that is going to provide more than the one that, that was lost health that's going to come in that will be so much more vibrant than what was there before. You are the God of all wonders and all creation. You could certainly be the God who answers those needs. Yes. And we ask you in faith 
Let the peace of God that goes beyond human understanding guide and settle each heart. To the glory of your name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done here on earth, here in our living rooms, here in our homes, just as it is in heaven. Yes. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Make his face to shine upon you. And I pray specifically, give you divine peace that governs your heart this week. Thanks for being with us, and God bless you. Until next time.